office. And and maybe you can pull up the. Uh, oh, I'm I'm here, babe. Um, maybe you can pull up the uh, the things anyway. Pull up what things? The people talking. Well, I mean, I'm here at live chat. Hello. Okay. Are we here? Are we live? Are we loud? Do we have volume? Yeah, I don't know. I don't, in fact, you know, it might be the case that we're just we're just done. Nobody's going to be watching. Oh, so. hello, Tethys. Oh my. Okay, I was starting to get a little worried that yeah, we, we were go. alone. It doesn't fit. Oh no. Did you see the the square thingy? Yeah, no, I see. I, I see we got but the uh, the shape of this thing is wrong for the. I can see where the shape from. Well, so. well, try the thing down there. Try the do the thing down there and see if it works for that. Oh, careful. Um, um, so David is right now shouting directions to John Quijada, who mm -hmm. is the esteemed, most notable, no notorious maybe, uh, yeah. <laughs> infamous creator of Ithquil, uh, who will be at KopiCon, and David, I think, there is we go. pulling, yep, there we go, David's pulling up the speaker profile yeah. on the KopiCon website, um, there and we go. so... That is who is on the other end here. Yeah. Um, sorry to hear that, Jonathan. Does it work on that? Appears to, yeah. Well, now oh, that's... No, wait, is it going down? They're, they're talking about some sort of cord situation. Here, why don't you put wow. yours down for the, for the time being and just take yeah, my let's, computer? Let's, well, I want to deal with this later. What? Well, well, hang on a second. Because I want to do some birthday shout-outs, so curious. I need... Well, now I'm... Okay, so... Sorry for all the confusion we'll here. Two, uh, two little spot there and oh, well, you gotta take that off. Oh, okay. Maybe that's what was holding it up. And then the cord got, kerfuffle continues. See, uh, it's gonna go like this. There you go. I will do some birthday okay. shout outs it was when. That rubber thing that was holding it up. Yeah. Did you get the did you get this one off? Here, let me see that. <laughs> okay, okay, so now I'm going to do some birthday shout outs. I think most of the talking, um, I don't have to what? shout too much. No, David just comes back and keeps. What, what, the, 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 what, are, you, what are you doing? <laughs> Trying to do birthday shout outs, but I don't want to have to like actually hey, shout do you to want talk these, over. Do you want these little things? No. Oh, okay. Uh, it works. <laughs> Yay! Okay, yeah. so the chords work that we don't even need for this. This has nothing to do with the stream, everything to do with an exciting development in technology. Yeah, um, and so now you can just find a place to put that, to sit it permanently, and then you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> but okay, All right. so this week's birthdays, we've got three. Okay. Okay, so Noel is going to have a birthday this week, who I don't uh -huh. think makes it very often to streams anymore. Beatrice yeah. Palmer, if you're out there, yep. happy birthday. But someone I know who is still active in the community, um, big birthday, everybody get ready. Happy birthday to Megan! Oh yeah, Woo! Megan and and can, oh wait, I don't know if we're sharing that info, but well, yeah, we, uh, we'll give a double congratulations. Yeah. But but also the you know uh, whose birthday it is today, John's wife Carol. Yes, it's her it's her birthday today. Woo! Isn't that cool? Anyway, so we thought that uh, since we were here, we would we would pull John over. And, and, and chat. So maybe what we can do is John can sit here for a minute and you can monitor chat. And I can just shout at you from the other side. Yeah, room. and so we'll, basically, we'll if, you, if you have, uh, if you wanna ask John about things, this, here we go, this is John. Oh, I've got your thing pulled up. And I have no idea, it, here, we can look at this thing and It'll be a little bit behind, and yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, so look, I, I pulled that up. Um, now you can get a general idea how we're framed and stuff. I'll do that or something. Sure. But um, anyway, um, and here I can just pull that up. So yeah, anyway, uh, so 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 John, did we did we first meet in person at LCC one or was it yeah. before that? No, it was at LCC one. No, it was LCC one. Yeah, I had uh, used your. Um, some example sentences from your Shathur grammar. So theory, yeah. Well, you used, you used example sentences from everybody's languages who presented. Yeah, and, oh. and, and, uh, and I uh, in included yours, so that was my first exposure to who you were. Yeah. And um, 
And I do remember that you, you were one of the people who laughed loudest at my jokes in, during, my, during my presentation. So obviously that already earned you a thumbs up in my, uh, in my uh, nice. you know, respect department. So, uh, yeah. Well, for, for, John's, for LCC1, I think that John's was the most popular talk. Um, I think just in, in terms of crowd response and then later on, I think it's also probably the most viewed talk after the fact. Nice. Uh, John, you presented on... Um, Cognitive uh, linguistics. Cog yeah, which is, um, I mean, for, for, I mean, first of all, it was presented very well, but for somebody like me coming out of Berkeley linguistics, it, you know, it was kind of uh, stuff that we already knew. But for a lot of people, it was brand new. Nice. You know, and it's the type of thing that con layers didn't think about a lot. Uh, and it's something that's really important, especially when it comes to uh, creating vocabulary and uh, not like creating verbal paradigms, but it's more like when you're thinking about uh, spatial relations, abstract relations, and how they relate, that type of thing. It's something that's very important. I think it's something that a lot of conlangers don't think about. As a side note, Carl mm -hmm. says uh, that he'll actually be using examples of John's writing system in his presentation. Oh, <laughs> oh you know what? I'm glad, I, I'm glad you told me that because uh, I've been trying to think of things to talk about in my, in my uh -huh. presentation at Copicon, and uh, uh, I had narrowed it down to five topics, one of which was the writing system for Ithquil. Uh -huh. so, if, uh -huh. so if someone else is going to be talking about it, I better take it off the list. Yeah, so, well, I'll I tell you. There could be too much said about it. I know that Carl will focus, yeah. I believe, on Yeah, we don't want to give too much away, but yeah, Carl's, uh, Carl's doing an orthography talk. And Carl does great work on, on that. So it's, but it's also going to be general. It's mm -hmm. not going to be just on the writing system of Ithquil. So I don't know. That, it could, it, I think the two could mesh, but um, you probably want to chat. Anyway, that's all right. I, I don't think anybody wants to hear about Ithquil. Maybe you can just... Um, <laughs> Well, considering that of all on fish, you know? <laughs> considering that of all the presentations I've done at language creation conferences, not mm -hmm. one of them has ever had anything to do with Ithquil. Yes. I thought maybe for once I should give a talk <laughs> about Ithquil. So well, now and that has me curious. I don't remember what you presented on in Austin. Uh, I no. basically uh, it was called. Um, it was all about um, uh, Worf's uh, cryptotypes. Um, oh, that's right. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, uh, trying to uh, put uh, find cryptotypes to put in your conlang because, uh, in my opinion, uh, one of the two things that conlangs lack in terms of verisimilitude is you know the lack of conceptual metaphor, which people are getting better at. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and secondly, um, the absence of cryptotypes, mm -hmm. and of course, nine out of ten. Conlangers would respond, "What's a cryptotype?" So that's why I gave that presentation in Austin to uh, hopefully educate a few people on what a cryptotype was and why they're so important if you want to make a, a truly nat lang style conlang, you know, yeah, a natural and language. Was titled untightening. Untightening your, your cryptotypes. cryptotypes, and I remember saying yeah. in the introduction, I said, "And if you have a problem with the word untighten." given that there's no such verb in English, then we're already on the right track. Nice. So. <laughs> nice. By the way, um, so the, of course you can watch that talk on YouTube because all the yes. LCC5 talks are up. Um, but uh, since it's been brought up, why don't you explain for people watching what cryptotypes are? Oh, I thought you were pointing at Jesse when you said that, so I thought she was yeah. going to provide the explanation. Uh, well, um, By the way, if you want to see Jesse, there she is. <laughs> the... Uh, no idea. The famous linguist a Worf, who's you know most famous for the Sapir Worf hypothesis, actually uh, is famous uh, for a few other things too. And he was the first person to identify, at least to my knowledge, uh, the concept of what he called cryptotypes in language, mm -hmm. which are hidden, covert patterns that operate at several level of several levels of language, including you know the semantic, the uh, morphological. Um, the morphosemantic levels, and um, these are patterns that are not even that not even native speakers of a language are aware of. Uh, an example being the way that uh, well, uh, one example that springs to mind is the fact that certain sorts of 
adjectives in English when strung together must be presented in a certain order. So mm. for example, we can't say the, the, red, big ball. the red big ball. We mm -hmm. gotta say the big red ball. Why? There's, you know, try to come up with a rational explanation for it. And not only does an English, a native English speaker not even realize they're doing it and that the constraint even exists, but when you bring it to their attention, like I just did, the native English speaker has no explanation for it. That's just one example of a cryptotype, and they, these, these occur throughout language. Um, there's lots of them in English. I'm trying to think of one that's more morphologically based. Um, I'd have to go with, look to my notes to uh, think of one. Uh, the use of um, the prefix un, the fact that you can only put it in front of certain types of verbs, which Worf found ha can be no more than two syllables long, I believe, and uh, otherwise you have to resort to paraphrase. Um, is it un that works that way, or was it? Um, uh, er. It was. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, that was the uh, the su not superlative, but the uh, comparative, comparative. Uh, suffix well, er superlative can too, only yeah. work on up to two syllable verbs. After that, you have to use the word more. So, um, so we can say things like you know un, uh, un, un uh, uh, all kinds of things, but you can't say untighten, and you can't say unloosen, and you can't say unhug, you know, things uh -huh. like that. <laughs> Although you can violate these cryptotypes in certain circumstances, like country music, you know, how do I unlove you, and things like that, in country music lyrics, for example, or Shakespeare does it in a, one of his plays, uh, was it one of the Richards, I forget which one, but uh, he uses the term un, unkinged. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, uh, I I uh, I had a, a thought here. Of one way that these that you can, I mean, it's not practical, but I'll tell you one great way to both uh, challenge your biases in case you are allowing your native language biases to creep in, but also to reveal cryptotypes. And I'll tell you how it happens. So I made this Duolingo course for High Valyrian, and let me tell you when especially non-native English speakers saying like um, you should accept this answer in English or you should accept this answer in High Valyrian and I look at that and it's like there's nothing in the grammar that says that that can't be allowed but you can't say that <laughs> you know and it's like oh no or it's like they say this should have this definition and it's like you know something where it's like they're using an, uh, a definite article and I have the best translation as an indefinite article. Valerian doesn't have any articles, but it's like, I look at it and it's like, mm, no, you can't, you can't use the definite article there because of that specific word order, that must be indefinite. But like, there's nothing in the grammar that tells you that. It was just like, I just know. And that's, and that's consistent with cryptotypes because you won't find a cryptotype explained anywhere in a gra formal grammar of a language because they they operate in a totally a totally covert way, and the grammarians of the language can't find a rational explanation for the covert pattern and the covert restraint. But the restraint exists. Um, so also speaking to native speakers, and you say something, and they laugh at you. <laughs> Often that's one yeah. of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, and they can't explain. Maybe why. that's where some of the best poetry has come from. In that you know, a poet heard a non-native speaker of English, you know, mangling a, a cryptotype and said, "Hey, I'm onto something." The other thing I pointed out in my presentation was that sometimes cryptotypes can change based on changes in culture. For example, prior to social media, there was no such verb in English, not even possible a possible verb in English to unfriend mm. but right. there is mm. now all because of social media you know? same so. with unsend yeah. yeah yeah wow okay anyway by the way are people in chat saying anything or is nobody watching um, no it's um, <laughs> pointed out that curious is a weird one that kind of got 
through Alice in Wonderland, right? Oh, yeah, curiouser and curiouser. Mm -hmm. And Jonathan points out that not all two-syllable adjectives will accept the er, and that's because it has to end in an e sound, so like you can say prettier. But oh, yeah, funnier. Do other funnier, but not funner. <laughs> but that's because that was not originally supposed to be an adjective. Yeah. That was a noun. Uh -huh. So because it got sort of zero derived to adjective status, it didn't necessarily mm -hmm. copy over. Uh, Matthias also points out that Macbeth uses unsex. Ah. Oh. And there you so go. that's another one. And Ragdoll says, I like doing quirky things like that with lyrics. There you Ragdoll go. Ragdoll is one of our musician poet Yeah. Artists. Oh, and a favorite Shakespeare one of mine. It's slightly different, but it's just using a noun as a verb that isn't usually a verb. Was uh, Benedict and Much Ado About Nothing say, No, the world must be peopled. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> yes, I love it. Oh, man. Anyway, um, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. What else? Um. <laughs> I, well, I don't know. You were in charge of this segment. Oh, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm in charge of things. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, so yeah, uh, KopiCon, blah, 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 September. Right. And um, I did see, like, somebody had asked on, it's a different Discord than uh -huh. ours, but on the one, a larger one for linguists in general. Um, people had mentioned, oh, maybe there's going to be a lot of video presentations. And I do want to clarify for anyone watching, our only planned video presentation will be Paul Cromer, who, who yeah. won't be able to be there. But everybody else on that schedule, like, unless something happens between now and September, it, we're all going to be there yep. in person. So with mm -hmm. Meridian, in person. John First Cotton, time. In person. Yeah. Um, and so, like, all of us will be together. And I will be accepting f offers of free drinks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. In person. <laughs> but, yeah, it, 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 it's kind of a bummer. Paul isn't going to be able to be there. Um, and it's just it's just impossible. Um, and so, yeah, actually, but he, I found, he's going to give a, a, a video presentation. Yeah, I found out uh, actually a few days ago because when, I, when you added his name to the guest list, I sent him a text saying, oh, Good to know. I'm going to see you in Washington D.C. And he wrote back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, not. You know. Yeah. And I also told him because uh, in your, your, the little bio information you gave on him, you mentioned that he was a student of Bernard Comrie. Yeah. Which I didn't know, and so I texted him, "You lucky dog. You, you know, you were a student of Bernard Bernard Comrie, who was one of my linguistic heroes. And the, one of the reasons for that, not, you know, not just all the wonderful titles in the Cambridge series that he's responsible for. But um, in particular, Comrie had a, a long out of print book that came out, I want to say 1981, somewhere thereabouts, called, uh, and I believe it was in the Cambridge series, uh, it was entitled Languages of the Soviet Union. Oh, wow. and, happy uh, birthday! <laughs> <laughs> Woo! And it, uh, I guess was never reprinted after the fall of the Soviet oh, Union wow. because the title was an anachronism now. Uh, but the book is very uh, sacred to me in terms of my own um, development uh, as a linguist and uh, conlanger in that it was the first book I ever read where I was introduced to the grammar of the Caucasian languages, oh. the North, the North, and, and well, what are today called the Northwest and Northeast Caucasian languages, which for any of your listeners, viewers, uh, who may have any inkling of the history of Ithquil's development were, were a very seminal influence uh, on Ithquil grammar. When I, when I first saw the slot structure of Abkhaz verb complexes, which was in that book, chapter five, I believe it was, of Comrie's book, I just basically said, my God, you know, this truth is stranger than any fiction, you yeah. know, this, this, this is just amazing that human minds can craft language this way. Yes. And, and I was just mesmerized by it, and it ended up having a direct influence through the years as, as the language which became Ithquil developed. Uh, it had a, a direct uh, influence uh, to the point where Ithquil's grammar is slot structured in the same way. So, uh, yeah. so that book is sacred to me, and, and that's, uh, that's why I told Paul Frommer how 
uh, envious I was that he had Comrie as a teacher. You know, a uh, little known fact about the Caucasian languages in me and John is that uh, we were at a, a very, very famous used bookstore in Berkeley called Moe's, and we happened to come across a grammar of the Georgian language. <laughs> and, and I found it first. He did, but I, I guilted him into letting me get it. You did. And uh, it really, it was just to spite him. Mm -hmm. I, I think I just use it to prop up a bookshelf now. <laughs> I don't even look at it. The but, only but I've reason got it. I let you have that book was because as much as I wanted it, I, some little voice in the back of my head said, you know, something tells me you'll be able to make better use of this book than me. <laughs> so knowing that it was used to prop up a door, you know, is, there you it, go. It, it proves my point since <laughs> I would have just used it to probably uh, uh, prop up a desk that was wobbling. So who knows? <laughs> uh, yep. And in the, the comments, just want to say, Carl says, don't worry, John, I'll get you a drink. Uh, also, <laughs> importantly, Matei's will be there in person. Ooh! The yep. And people were asking, wait, this is the first time Viv will ever be anywhere in person? I think so. That's right. I think so. That's right. We'll so there. It's really a 3D hologram, and I'm so excited. And there's this mysterious figure who goes by the name of, of Bib Loridian, who uh, mm -hmm. it may not be his real name. But he's on YouTube and does a lot of conlang videos and has amassed a huge following. Mm -hmm. um, emerged out of nowhere. Uh, and nobody knows anything about him, how old he is, and certainly nobody's ever seen him in person, no single person. Um, Don't you have pictures of all your guests on your um, I on did. the KopiCon yes, website? Yeah. Covered. Yeah, he's covered his oh. face. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. It's like, it's like uh, the next door neighbor in. Uh, and home yeah, improvement, yeah. You only ever see his eyes. Well, I mean, I don't mean to rain on anyone's parade here, but then how do you know it's him? You know? Yeah. Mm. How will we you know it's trust. him when we you arrive? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, and also Remy is here, so. Hey, nice. All right, but anyway, so yeah, that's uh, uh, a chilling vision of things to come. Um, yes. Anyway, but... Uh, and, and anyone who gets to go to Kobe to be a part of these kinds of conversations for a whole day. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but yeah, should we get to it? I, I think so. All right, let's, let's have a very brief conversation about this. So we think that we've set things up to go ahead and stream in there so you can have use of this room. Is oh. that? Uh, if you wish, that's fine. You're I welcome. Mean, my, I you mi casa that. es tu casa, so. Well, I mean, otherwise <laughs> it's just this room, but this mm -hmm. is kind of like, you know, a big room, so I didn't want to take this room I'll, away I'm, from All I'm going to do is uh, be, I'm going to be reading that rule book to that uh, game we're going to play. So. Well, if, if you don't mind then, then you and Jesse could just switch seats. Okay. But, but nice, basically... Uh, nice not seeing everyone because I've just been looking at a screen that uh, doesn't show anyone, but... Yeah. <laughs> but, but also, like, I have put water in here. I set up my space. Oh, you did? Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, well, you guys can go in there if you want. I mean, it's up to you. Well, I mean, it... I, no, I just I'd rather stay. Hey, do you happen to have any hard candy? Any type of hard candy? Uh, David is giving a little preview of the fact that I forgot to pack the Kopi Co. Yeah. Oh gosh, I don't. We try to avoid sweets like the plague around here. So let me see. I don't have anything. Uh, yeah. So that was. Uh, but that was my fault because I forgot to remind Jesse to pack the <laughs> Kopi Co. Um, Some crunchy granola. Crunchy granola. It fits the heart. It, it, it certainly fits the Kopi Con theme. <laughs> Crunchy granola. Yeah. You know that that was, you know, the introduction of granola to the general public was at Woodstock. <laughs> it was uh, the guy who owned the farm, you know, Yasmer's farm. He, uh, you know, on the first morning, right? He basically, he said, my goal is to serve, you know, breakfast to thousands. And he kind of gave out granola to everybody. And that was where granola became associated with hippies. I think we need to order a special thing of Copico that just stays in our bags for traveling. Yeah. Um, to Good Silvertail, idea. it's like, oh, you forgot it again? Yeah, 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 Silvertail, we did. I also forgot that the watermark that we have... Um, Best thing Neatly to do sits is one thing crunchy in the house. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. All right. Okay. We'll so we'll have that. We'll celebrate later with granola bits. Okay. 
<laughs> All right. So, uh, and by the way, just to, I think, I think you know this, John, but essentially, you know, we're creating, a, we create a language live, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, we're, at, we're at the point, we're creating a language for dogs. It's mostly isolating. Uh, and we do polls. And this week, the poll is, um, what was it? I don't know. You. It was the copula. That's right. Oh, wait. Yeah. And I was like, you figured the results. We were deciding what type of copula to have. And I mailed myself or I texted myself the the results. The taste says we could uh, celebrate with some truly mediocre Berlin sushi. <laughs> so, oh my gosh. all right. So the copula, we were, we were deciding we were going to do one of two things. First, we decided that we are. We already decided we're going to have a copula. Um, oh, oh, wait a minute. Something's tickled Jesse's fancy. I don't know if you still count, but I found these. Oh, no, no. Oh, God, no. <laughs> no. Cough drops, y'all. No. Cough drops. Back no. Cough drops. Um, oh, okay, but God. what tickled me was that... They have plenty of artificial sugar in That is true. <laughs> um, what tickled me is that Remy had commented, I'm on the treadmill at the gym, and when you said granola was popularized at Woodstock, I just blurted out, shut up. <laughs> yes, that's amazing. <laughs> Oh my gosh. All right. So anyway, so we are copula, right? All right. So we, we had five potential strategies. One was to have one, just, just a plain copula, one copula, and that was it. And that was so unpopular that it got no votes. So I'm just throwing that out at the, at the beginning. And to be fair, I didn't, I, I had told David to include it, not because I thought it would be popular, but because I thought it is a completely valid option that it's we should consider. It's a legit option. Okay. But no votes. So. Uh, now I'll explain the other strategies and I'll tell you how the votes went. So next, we were having a number of um, strata, I guess, we were considering to include with the, with the copula. One was to have two copula, equitive and locative, all right? And then uh, it was uh, equitive and locative plus some other feature. The features were have equitive and locative times polarity. So that's positive and negative equitive, positive and negative uh, locative. Next was equitive locative plus tense, say probably past and non past. So that's, you know, equitive past and non past, locative past and non past. Mm -hmm. And then finally was equitive, equitive and loc locative times permanence. So permanent and non permanent equitive, permanent and non permanent locative. Mm -hmm. All right, so votes. Uh, there, there were two tied for next to last place very low votes. Equitive versus locative only had three votes. So did equitive and locative times tense. Okay. Uh, so each of those only had three which, votes. Which I'm, I'm good with that because we had chosen not to do tense on the other verbs, right? Or we had, I guess we haven't really discussed that. No, we haven't. Uh, okay, okay. We're, so. we're not having any inflection, but uh, Okay, and then so that leaves the other two. So it's either polarity, negative and positive, or permanence, permanent, impermanent. The winner won by one vote. <gasps> yeah. It, vote was 19 to 18. Oh, my gosh. And the winner was polarity. Polarity beat out permanence. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to have a negative and positive, equitive and locative copula. Whoa. Um, that is... I guess surprising. That's, pre I guess. that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, so that that is really really cool. Um, so one thing that I am a little disappointed about is that I had had an idea for what to do with the the permanence situation, but since we won't have that, um, I won't. No. You're you're a moderator. No, I'm a moderator. Um, David's pulling up YouTube on his phone so he can more readily. Um, so I'm in live chat, top chat. How do I, is it this? All messages. There we go. Oh, they changed it from live chat to top chat and all messages. I, like I think they were watching our stream and how much yeah. I was complaining about live chat, live chat versus live chat, top chat. Bubba, as the person who suggested doing permanence, is saying, I don't like the results. Ask John his opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. What is this heart here? Okay, so I appreciate this, but like, 
it covers up part of the message. It sure does. What? That's stupid. My goodness. Here, I'm going to put that. What does oh, that even gosh. do? I don't know, but you almost put someone in timeout. Uh, oh, it sends up a little heart on our video, I think. I don't know. Well, that's weird. Look at that. Does anybody else see that? I'll do it again. Well, David's just sending up hearts. Like, are you seeing know. these hearts? Like, is anybody see? Like, oh my God, David is sending so many emoji reactions. Like, is this just me this entertaining myself? Like, it's like, um, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of the old, um, uh, the thing before Boomerang, uh, which was, um, you know, where you did live videos and, and, and people, okay. But Silver, wait. Oh my God, other people are doing that. Oh my goodness. But like, I don't, you can only see it if you're apparently on in the app. the app looking at the chat because it's not showing up on the video and it's not showing up on my, this is, my YouTube studio version. This is so stupid. But like, okay, there was a, there was an app and I don't know if it's still in existence, but it allowed you to um, just live stream whatever, like while you were on the go. And then people could tune in and watch, and as they were watching, like they would give you little reactions <laughs> like this. They've essentially copied that. Well, I know that Facebook videos um, do the same, where anybody. Yeah, but like, yeah, it started with that app, and it and it was like attached to Twitter. And it's not in the Android app. Yeah, and so like, but also it just covers up like if you have a long message like Magpie just gave, it covers up the end of the message until somebody else puts a message in to bump it up. Yeah. That's so stupid. All right, well. Oh, well, Bubba's apparently able to see it, so, um, from an Android. So, well, Bubba, it's a curious uh, it, thing. These um, little ex explodey things are for As you. As Mateus pointed out, curiouser and curiouser. Yeah, this is just silly. Anyway. All right, so let's let's make this real. Let's talk, let's get into the grammar here. Um, and in case anyone has forgotten, one of the reasons uh, that Magpie's language is called Sprink is because it started over spring break. Mm. Put the two together and what do you get? Sprink. Yeah. Either that or Sprank. Oh. Or Sprank. Sprank, yeah. Because otherwise spray, the, the N would, would interfere, but... Yeah. By the way, I'm going to... I, I, sometime before our next stream, I'm going to cut my hair a little bit. Are you just blaming I, I, everybody? I because I, no one will recognize David. I just don't like the hair. way it's looking. I'm going to cut my hair a little bit. All right. So what we have to do then is... is make this real. Yeah, come up with some... Um, I don't know what you call them. Etymological forms. What do we call them? Um, you mean brutes? You know, the, the thing where it comes from it, that's what I meant. Source? Yeah, that's, that's it. I was trying to think of, like, what other words you were trying to think of here. All right. There are a few different copulae in Halchov. There is uh, an equative copula, mm -hmm. which has a positive and negative form and a locative copula, which also has a positive and negative form, resulting in four different copulae. All right. Jake also suggests the mummy word or the birthing lexing. And Ragdoll says, you don't need to cut your hair. Yeah, well, no, no, I'm not gonna like cut, cut it. I'm gonna do what I call a micro cut to adjust it. Um, yeah. You see it on the i you only see it on the iPhone app and interacting with it. Uh yeah. show anyone else anything is probably yeah. and and you know what? Uh somebody do some of those thingies right now. Some of the somebody do some of those little hearts or whatever. Because I think I, I don't know, but I think you can only do it on the iPhone app if it is, it is in vertical. portrait mode, not landscape. And uh, if they're doing it, it sure is not showing up. Yeah. <laughs> and so that's another fun little wrinkle. That's the most this, And so that's that may also answer thing. why Remy couldn't see it, but Bubba could. Maybe yeah. you're looking at it 
is a different because it's not even showing up as an option for David to no. react right now. Yeah. Okay, Bubba is confirming. Yeah, it's only that's in the, so, the portrait. That's so ridiculous. That gets a goat. That gets a goat. Uh, Matisse. Landscape is a Dutch word, so I'm always in that mode. Love it. Um, oh, Zach says, yeah, the heart's appearing on an iPad, too. So, yeah, but, well, Remy, sorry. I tried to yeah. I tried to figure it out for you. I'm done, done technologically. Yeah. Done technologicalizing that? Yeah, yeah, you can't Philosophizing. Technological, my guy said that. Okay. okay, so let's get, yes, and, and um, purple negation mm. will, will be a feature. We'll figure that out. Yeah. Um, and a locket of copula. Sure, sure. So we've got our four different copulae. Hello. Um, oh, my God. I just had a brilliant idea. And by, by a brilliant idea, I mean it's, it's kind of a copycat idea, but it makes sense. So Because you see it a lot with uh, verb initial languages. So, all right. We're gonna, we need to come up with our forms for the copulae. But when we do, all right. So, like, it, it'll be easy enough to say, like, you know, you know, uh, the dog is a warrior. The dog is not a warrior. Mm -hmm. The dog is near the tree. The dog is not near the tree. For other verbs, mm -hmm. since we're going to have these, negati these negative copulae anyway, all right, uh, you, we could say something like, it is not that, you know, the dog um, saw a cat. So the dog didn't see a cat or the dog doesn't see a cat. Um, and... If we want, we could have subject to subject raising and could say the dog is, is not the dog saw a cat. I'm going to need you to start over. We're doing, so what, you, instead of focusing on just the copula right now, you're saying once we get the copula. Oh, yeah. We jump straight ahead. We, we could actually use this for negation strategies. Yes. And we can have different strategies depending on if we want to pull up the subject of the embedded, the object, or the oblique. Oh, this is going to be fun. This is going to be so fun. So David just jumped ahead this um, is going to be this oh i'm really excited about this language okay mm. up until now he was not now he is um oh man since you brought up prince i wanted to bring up something about prince but uh i'm gonna wait to see if john comes back in the room because it was very interesting and it's about prince and it's about music but you know i don't want to just share it you know if john's here i don't want to i, I want to wait because you know we're both we're both music guys. Anyway, um, <clears throat> okay, forms, forms, all right. Um, yes. Okay, the uh, four copulae are listed below, and then we um, need to do um, a bullet, uh, image bullets, and I'll let you deal with that. But that's well, pretty good. Look at that square. <laughs> it, it will get better. Okay. Um, as soon as I find what I was looking for, like it should be in here, I thought. Oops. Oh. Okay, okay. Now I know where it is. I also wanted to see if it let me post images. No, I don't think it will. Oh, you're just looking at notes. Well, I was trying to see if I could add ooh, this. Oh, my. No. Oh. It won't let me add it. Oh. Okay. But that's going to become our bullet point. Well, you know what we can do? We, we haven't made, taken much advantage of this. Um, we have the ability to add unique um, icons uh, or emotes to YouTube. And we've only yeah. done four of them. And then, like, theoretically, if you join YouTube as a member, then you can use them. But um, we can add more. <gasps> oh, my goodness. Oh, look at that. Look, it's Vincent. Well, just a second, I'm making them bigger. 
Well, you don't need to necessarily make them bigger. Well, I can go back to 80. That's what it was set at. Wait. You decide if you like that. This is what it was set at. You can, you can, but doesn't that change the size of the font? It only no, it's the bullet size. Oh, that's so cool. Well, no, let's let's go ahead and make was, it a hundred. I was gonna do it at a hundred, and then you said don't change it. Can you do it? Well, oh you, my god! Yeah, I mean, but then it's a little too big for the. the Here, hold space. on. I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom in so everybody can see that. We're okay. So let's we're uh, fit with. Okay, that's the zooming that we are. Uh, but here. Look at him in all his glory with his little scarf. Oh, that wasn't good. Hold on. There we go. Right. Okay. So now that that is another bullet point we can have. Uh, maybe George hasn't been here in a while. We named the language a while ago, George. Um, yeah. Well, I am and purple is definitely listed in my daughter's idiolect. She still, she still says Ament. Yeah, she still has it. And you know, every so often, I still hear her doing noun, adjective, word order. I haven't heard that one. But I've heard it. I've heard it oh, twice in the past two weeks. Yesterday, we got a, a really awesome twenty-one. Oh. Because it's on the twenty-one of May. That's that right. Some raid is happening. That's right. And I was very excited about that. Hmm. Um, okay. But sorry, we can go on. I was seeing if we had any other options, but I don't think we've actually gotten more um, emojis really for the dogs. And so, yeah, Vincent, I think, is a great stand-in. Mm -hmm. So go on. Go on. Go on. What were you saying? I don't know. Oh, but <clears throat> Yeah, we named the language. Yay! Okay, so these... Copulae, right? They're going to be special because they're going to essentially occupy this initial position, which uh, only these are going to be able to occupy. We're essentially uh, creating a position in our syntax that is somewhat unique. It's uh, like VVSO. It is, except that um, we can, it can be empty, essentially, right? Um, Ooh, Logan just did an interview. Hope it went well. Uh, you know, that's ambiguous. I know. I don't know if Logan was the one leading the interview or was interviewed, but either way, I hope it went well. And in fact, it's doubly ambiguous. So there's four versions, kind of like our equative and locative, positive and negative copula, because... It could be a reporter interview where maybe Logan was interviewing something for his podcast uh, or where Logan was interviewed by somebody, you know, for like a podcast or an article or something. But then there's also a job interview. And again, well, Logan did a, yeah. a recommendation interview uh, for hiring somebody else. Oh, uh -huh. so like you were so this was a job interview and you were leading it. Mm -mm. No. No, it's like when they call you and do interviews of the recommenders. Okay. Because they want to say, what about this candidate? Got it. This is what we thought. Okay, okay, okay. And okay, so okay, Logan okay. was the, the recommender. The interviewee. Yeah. The interviewee. Okay. But Logan's not up for the job. Logan's just trying to help someone else get a job. Well, that's cool. That's always nice. Um, I mean, I guess that's technically a third type of interview, but I would say that was a subtype of a job interview. It kind of is, because yeah. you're still trying to provide good information in a way that will help somebody get hired at the end of it yeah um and so yeah like it's a it's a type of thing i i did one of those actually for my good friend uh, james barry who's now with nbc but it wasn't um an interview it was like essentially a google like you fill out a form well that's how yeah most of them are um but yeah some still do like hmm. interview interviews okay now, and theory neutral back. released a new episode to get today. That is uh, Logan's podcast. Ooh, yay! Um, 
and it's called theory neutral that should be enough for you to find it uh, on the internet because it's always I'd ask Logan to paste a link but it seems to be very funky and finicky actually about that. I can look at that the podcast is the first one that comes up um, should I do Spotify response? No, go see if Logan's got a web so the the website. Uh, it's better because then it can lead you to any one of them. I mean, w- one of those, like I mean the the original one. Well, I can look it up here and see if yeah. I can. Anchor.fm. That's your main one? It's the Spotify. That is the main one. Eh. All okay, right. So I'm going to post that link. There we go. Oh, and by the way, uh, uh, patrons, um, you may have noticed that it was the first of May three days ago and there wasn't a podcast. That was because we forgot. But we are going to do one soon, and Jesse has a really cool idea. Oh, I'm for excited. It. Yep. So yeah, it'll be good. It'll be late, but it will be good. Yeah. A lot of pressure on me now. Um, and then, yeah. Okay. Whoops. So I'm going to throw down some... <laughs> Jonathan did not notice. See, I was going to like not say anything. Oh. And then just like, wham, bam, hey, here's the May podcast. So I'm just going to throw uh, some... Uh, we're brainstorming ideas mm-hmm. for copyright. So, positive locative, I've got plenty of ideas for that. Stand, sit, lie, something like that. If only, like, it wouldn't make sense for locative in general because you're, you're doing more than just locating dogs. Um, but somebody had mentioned the other day to have something related to spiral in the dog's language where there's a verb where, you know, the dogs, dogs will do that thing where they run in circles um like the video i sent you of that dog playing with a cat who just started oh, yeah, uh, yeah 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 zooming in a circle uh but that wouldn't make sense because a lot of things you're trying to locate either don't move at all or don't move in the same way dogs do and so you yeah we do want something a little bit more generic uh but that would be really funny yeah and then for um oh man before we even talk about the positive equitive copula we should ask if it's just going to be the VNN or VNPN. Okay, so what David is asking is, is this going to be um, like, let's, let's say our, our locative copula comes from to stand. I'm not mm-hmm. saying that's it, but let's say it does. Would we say stand dog park or would we say stand dog at park? Um, like something where we still have some sort of preposition required. Um, and that's an interesting question. Um, not for the locative one. That absolutely is going to require a preposition. Oh, that's the one I thought we were working on, and then you skipped. Okay. No, that I mean the the locative one is always going to require a preposition. That's why it's locative. But um, the posi- the equitive one, that's the one I meant. Mm. Well, then you can give an example. <laughs> well, I mean, just you know, like you imagine the verb like act can be used as a uh, equitive copula, except that it requires an as. So it's like dog acts as teacher. Mm. You know, um, and so I don't know, like do like bark like or something. I don't know. Mm-hmm. So now we just need ideas for equitive copula. Do you have any? Well, bark is obviously one of them. Okay. Um, does anyone else have any ideas? Uh, I'm just going to throw out basic, uh, that is, um, it could just be basic. So no, no other meaning. Um, so to reflect, to whine, to sniff, smell, to yap, Mm. um, 
So I think, although bark is kind of difficult, I, I don't know how much we want to use that uh, because we've already set up the distinction that bark and howl are the basic words out of two different dialects of dog languages that came together to create the bark howl language, which is where the num name comes from. Right. Um, and so um, to act, um, if we wanted to, instead of act, I was just going to say to move or or to walk. Yeah, that's um, true. Like something. Um, I don't know if this makes sense necessarily as a verb, but to uh, present. So in other words, to like, you know, present oneself to stand up as, you know, to. Though I really like the um, Tethys's idea to mm -hmm. smell, but meaning the scent given off it smells like this because they really do rely on smelling things and that's um, one of the ways dogs recognize um, other dogs and other people um, is you know the smell is familiar and so if you say it smells like a tree it is a tree okay we think okay I'm, if it acts like a dog, duck and walks like a duck, is it a duck? I'm actually willing to throw that in. I, I think that's that's so good that that's what it should be. So thank you, Tethys. And that was, so, but I'm gonna that was good. I'm gonna suggest this um, syntax smell x from y. And what are our three prepositions? Well, right now we have. Genitive and where are they? Uh, they're somewhere at the top because it was the palatalization and whatnot. So I would search for palatal. Palatalization. I don't think we've written them in the grammar proper. I think they're no, above. no, we haven't. They're under prepo, prepo submissions because prepo submissions, yeah. you decided to keep my typo, but that is so not helpful when you're trying to search for it. Genitive. Um, which is really what I started with was genitive. Yeah. Yeah. What are, hold on, what are the, um, what are the sources of these, the, the uh, lexical sources? Um, Ohm is belly. Yeah. So we have belly, chase, and heel. I'm trying to... Oh, to heel, to follow. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, heel, to, heel to kind of follow makes sense. Okay. Yep. So X genitive. Why? Okay. Okay. Logan's asking if we're going to get standardized basic scent terms for this language. Are you asking? I'm not sure what you're asking, Logan. It, like having color terms, but for scents. Yeah. Is uh, that is that what you mean? Yeah. It's um, it's it's a thing. Basically, um, I'm going to leave it to Logan to come up with some basic scent categories, and then maybe we can come up with uh, words for them. Okay. Okay. Also, if you want, you can pull that up on your phone, and then you can free up the screen. But then I won't look at my phone. Like, like that would be too far for me to actually read. Really? I appreciate the thought, though. Um, yeah, Logan will send Logan's us an email, email. We'll, nice. and we'll share it. Nice. Um, <clears throat> Thank you in advance. Okay. And so, um, and then this will be uh, whatever it is. So, X locative Y. Um, so why don't we do this because it's easy. What do you, um, so we have belly lie that we're already using for a preposition, prep submission, excuse me. 
Um, uh, so I, I think that I think that narrows it to stand or sit. Mm-hmm. Um, sit is intentional. Stand is not intentional. I don't know if that's going to make a difference for what choice we want to make. Well, also, like, I, I guess it doesn't matter. It's just going to get extended because we're presumably going to be able Stay to... Stay grammar, Jonathan. Um, bye, Jonathan. Um, presumably, though, we're going to have... If we can use either or any locative preposition, could we have a construction where it's like... Essentially, he's going to the park, like he's not at the park, um, and use the, um, you know, the lot of preposition to, to indicate, like, he's on his way to the park. No, you'd have to use a different verb. And so we can't use all prepositions. We can only use one preposition that we have so far, the S of. I mean, it, it, you can use it if it makes sense. But I'm asking, is it going to get extended where it got semantically bleached to the point where it just means location and your location can be on the move? Like if you're on a train from one place to the other, you're statically on a train, but you're actually, you know, on your way to another place. Um, maybe, but it's like, it's not like it's... Yes, but not the way you mean. I don't know. It, we're, but we're like, yes, it, something that we could do. Like, we, we could... It, it's not going to mean go, all right? <laughs> but like... It, I, I didn't ask for it to mean go. I'm but asking, like, 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 could you say, like, if it's... I, I don't even want to use stand or sit because semantically they don't make sense. But once they become grammaticalized as the locative copula, they no longer mean stand and sit. They're, they're going to be like... So no, it's n- some other meaning. No, I don't know how to convey this properly, but the answer is yes if we want to, but it's not going to change that copula. It's always going to mean static. But you know, just like we can say I am off to the store, doesn't mean that am got semantically bleached so that it now means go. It just means that construction, you can use that. I think you completely misunderstood my point. My question was, can we use both prepositions that we have with this? The lot of and the s of. If we want to. Okay. I didn't say it was going to change the meaning of the verb. And so, like, I feel like you got caught up on the wrong aspect of it. I was just asking, would we be able to use that lot of preposition? Or are you already thinking, like, this is... Because that's going to help me think through what verbs we might use. But basically, if you want to. Um, so I, but it's like, it's going to be a lexical choice. It's not going to be the basic one. Were you concerned? Well, yeah, because my thing just crapped out. But as long as we're still going there, then we're fine. I'll just try to reload it on my end. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, goodness, I, I can't get it back. Oh, Remy had to go to state grammar. Yeah, well, son of a gun, I can't seem to get it back. So as so long as... So aren't you glad that I didn't decide to use my phone? As long as it's still going. Um. Am I just not getting internet? I think that's what's happening. I think my phone's not... Doing well, we can we can worry about your phone later while we, you know, we still got, got things. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, Kyle just said everything slowed down, so. Um, I think that it's having trouble with the internet, so cool. maybe I should. Stop trying on a third um, device. Yeah, but, but that's nice because for my phone, I can just put it on Wi-Fi. It might not, we don't have great signal, but. Um, Anyway. And so, yeah, I think using, because we can, we, we chose a, a fun, unique source 
um, for the equative. And so I think kind of going basic for the locative will be yeah. fine. Um, it's really interesting that you, you say that it involves intentionality because from the human body perspective, standing and sitting both involve intentionality. That's true. Um, because you had to, you, you have to do something to stand. Um, yeah. That's not just your basic body, like, oh, that's, that's how I'm most human. Um, whereas when we apply it to, you know, inanimate things, it's like the tree stands here, it never sits because it's like, it's things stand, building stand, tree stand, things that don't move stand because they're just, quote, upright because they're unable to sit. Um, and so that's just really interesting because I think some animals would see standing as the more natural thing. Um, kind of like I think horses or cows, like you just kind of see them standing more often. So that may feel more natural to them. Hmm. Um, Logan has to do another know. work thing, another non-interview work thing. Hmm. Bye, Logan. Good luck on whatever work thing it is. Ah, Jake, is there a verb which is like to chase something you thought would be there but isn't? I oh mean, my God, that's amazing. Put a pin in that. <laughs> oh, Kyle, that's why you said it slowed down. <laughs> I, thought, I thought something slowed in our internet connection, but Kyle was just like watching everything double speed and then suddenly came back to normal speed and now is like, what are you doing, David, just, blowing up? I'm just adding. Okay. And oh, that's nice, Matthias. That's interesting, Bubba. I would not naturally use sit. Like, I would not say the tree sits here. Mm. I would say the tree stands here. Yeah. I could say the house sits at the corner, I guess. But, like, I think stand would be my, my more basic way of saying that. Um... So that's really interesting. That's a dialectal thing. Yeah. Uh, oh, and George is suggesting looking at, I don't know if you pronounce it ho, hokak or hochak. It's a funny thing. Positionals to see how objects can be seen as naturally standing, sitting, or lying down. The funny thing is I looked at that and it looked to me like a Turkish word, so I said, oh, hojak. <laughs> or that. I mean, that could definitely... Uh, be that stand and lie are common copulate in Norwegian. Nice. You know, based on the fact that dogs are naturally standing, I feel like stand is it. Mm. Because, like, it's so basic. I feel like that's a common thing to just get semantically bleached because it's like, you say the dog is standing there, it's just being there. Which is why they have three different verbs for to like, because that is a very yeah. specific orientation, and sitting could be the same. Yeah, all right. <clears throat> okay, so now we need to get to the complicated question of the negative ones. And I think this may have been why um, uh, Jake suggested chasing something that ends up not being there. Um, but... I know that you had ideas for impermanence and permanence, right? I did, but not for these. Yeah. Um, but like one that just made me laugh um, in my head was for the negative equative, uh, to use to bathe. <laughs> because once you bathe, you lose your scent. But not really. It was just a little joke in my head. But oh, shake. Oh, shake for to lose scent. Yeah, I mean, because it's not really like losing scent, but it's like, that's how you, to shake is like to get rid of mud, you know? It's nasal, ho-chonk, ho-chonk. Oh. Oh, sometimes also spelled ho-chonk because of that, so ho-chonk. Nice. Um, flea, um, um, yeah, flea is a good one, so thank you, Jake. And thank you, Bubba, for bringing that back to attention. Oh, Silvertail is more likely to say the house sits, but more likely to say the tree stands. This is so, like, now I, I want to do, like, some sort of little investigatory paper on inanimate objects and dialectal versions of specifically American English, since that's the one I'm more familiar with. 
to find out whether sitting or standing things. That is fascinating. Anyway, okay, but flee, I like that. Um, leave, sure. Uh, the reason I don't know that bathe would work is that it wouldn't work in the same construction, and I think we should keep the same construction overall, right? Like, we shouldn't be like, oh, you smell X genitive Y, but you bathe Oh no, I, XY. Oh, I have no problem with that. But, oh, um, okay, okay. But, uh, but, I, but also, this is just the brainstorming phase. You, you write everything down. Um, there's, we got swim, I think it's kind of a variation of bathe. It's also interesting, um, I can't remember what we were just watching, but, um, old, maybe it's just an older thing, I don't know if it's British or American, but talk about bathing, meaning to go in a river and swim. Mm. Oh, it was, uh, the Moomin books. Mm -hmm. Uh... I mean, back in the day, that was how you bathed. Yeah, I guess so. Um, Most dogs shake after they get wet, and you get wet from bathing. And so, a shake would be good. Yeah. Mm. I'm trying to also think, like, what would mask an odor? And so, like, they don't smell like X. Hmm. Hmm. Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right, so it's on. Um, uh, I'm gonna write down rain. I don't know how the syntax of that will work, but I'm going to write it down. Hmm. I... Gosh, I'm in one of those like brainstormy spaces, which means it's hard to talk aloud, which is so not good for a live streaming situation. Hmm. Hmm. I guess to groom could be another, but that'd be more like a cat thing. Yeah, it would be a cat thing. Um, I'm going to just say, I, I really like flea. We can have another word for flea or, or a doublet to be the modern word for flea. But um, flea X and this one is going to be... I, I have um, a thought there. Um, I would like you to explain that thought actually because I'm like why genitive and not like from this place um, like a kind of s of uh, because of the source let's go up to the preface missions again so we have hua omen i um, I is to heal, and then Hua is chase, Om is belly. Lie. Uh, and yeah, neither of them actually makes a ton of sense. I mean, certainly not Chase, that, that, but that wasn't being considered. Because if what you're saying is like... I guess it has to be. The dog is not at the park. Flea dog of park. That was what I wanted. I wanted something like from agentive, but that's really not what heal is. Heal mm -hmm. is more following. I guess it does have to be 
Esif and rather than the from idea that I had, it's, it's just like if the dog is fleeing in or around the park, you just say that that extends to mean he flees it. All right. So, oh, and I'll, but, uh, but, so this locative, it's supposed to be, can occur with any locative, but this, it'll be specifically F, so. But I suppose it could be the same thing. I suppose it could be the same thing. Okay. I'm I'm fine with that. Let's um let's move on to the negative equative. So um I think my favorite of them is shake. Rain gets into a sticky area of us having yeah. to decide weather verbs. And I don't know that we're there yet. Okay. Um and shake specifically like shake off. Um yeah. like you're you know, getting the water out, getting so the dog shakes. Or it just shakes in general and it shakes, you know, either at the belly of or what? Healing. Uh, this one I could almost see just being noun noun. Especially if you think like shake as in shake off. The I, dog shakes off a tree. The dog is not a tree. I I really don't. I really see it as being an intransitive verb that's going to require something to give it another argument. So I'm going to leave that to you then, because that's where my brain is, and I can't. Hey. Are you still on? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But it's all right. You know, it's very informal. You want to say, you want to say hi to everybody? Hi, Here. everyone. you got to come there over. Oh. This is where the camera is. Okay. And I'll, I'll tell you when we can see you. Try to put your head in between me and Jesse's. And we're waiting. It's... It takes a while to... Oh, wait. Let me get this caught up here. Oh, yeah. There we go. There, there we go. Hi. Oh, there there you come? Yeah. <laughs> so this is on like a delayed, and it's always hard to tell when we yeah. do things. We're like, did this Yeah. Work? Oh, there. that works. That works really well. Yay. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is John's wife, Carol, whose birthday it is today. Yes. Yay. Well, it's nice to meet all of you. Uh, I'm certainly uh, familiar gotcha. with the... Uh, conlanging world through <laughs> John and knowing Dave and Jesse and some of the other conlangers. So uh, I'm learning through osmosis. Yes, <laughs> yes. Learning so, a lot, I think. I, I've met some, I have to say, I've met some very interesting people over the years. And, oh, yeah. You know, the, the writer who did the article. Oh, yeah, Joshua Foy. Joshua Foy, mm -hmm. a very nice. He's young man and you know got to meet him in New York so uh, yeah so it's been great <laughs> that is well, awesome I'll let you go yeah and then a bunch of people are saying happy birthday to thank you, you everyone <laughs> <laughs> say I'm gonna let you take that uh -huh. tease it out I mean like I just felt like you know shaking is just a natural thing and uh, I guess I was like I had specifically mentioned to me this is to shake off uh-huh yeah not to shake and you can shake water off you can shake something off yes um, it's not just like trembling shaking it's why oh, it's like you're getting something off which is why I think it could just be a noun noun argument. This is what I felt like. The dogs, they don't shake. Oh, Bubba has to leave. Like that. Stay grammar, Bubba. Yeah, they don't shake like that unless something makes them do it. What don't, sorry? Dogs don't shake like that unless something makes them do it. Okay. And so because of that, there has to be something agentive that causes it. 
you, it, it's, you're listing the cause of it, you know? Okay. Are you not understanding or are you not agreeing? Both. How can you not agree if you don't understand? Like, dogs don't shake like that unless they're wet, unless they're dirty, unless they have something on them that they don't like. And so they're not shaking, you know, and they're not shaking something off. They're shaking because of it. They're shaking because this has happened. And so which of our three tiny prepositions, which we need more if we're going to make all of these work, I think, mm. which of our three prepositions is a because of? Um, here, hold on a sec. I'm too far behind here to be useful. I don't know why it's so Jake far is behind. loving the creative tension happening. And I would think so, George, that there would be a different word for just like other kinds of shaking where you can shake for all sorts of reasons. Oh, I'm not disagreeing, but... Um, I'm not saying that was part of the discussion. I was just saying that George was mentioning, are there going to be? And it's like, I think so. Mm. Aww. Ragdoll's cat wiggles his hips when he wags his tail. That's mm. adorable. Oh, that's really cute. Um... <laughs> Dogs don't shake and hips don't lie. That's right. <laughs> yes, Miles. Oh my God, Mateus, you've had a bunny. Well, let's let's ignore the potential ending. Bunnies don't don't live forever. I've heard. Um, but I do want to see a picture of your bunny. Have you posted that? Have you shared that somewhere? Because I would love to see it. Um, okay. And also, though, we really, at some point, do need to talk about maybe expanding. I, I was not under the impression that we were only going to have three prepositions in this language. Oh, no. I thought it was just we targeted three for mutations. Mm -hmm. It's, and we, we get to expand from there. And to me, this seems like an expansion case. Well, you're going to make compound prepositions using one of these three. But um, in this case, I feel like it should be one of these three basic ones. Gosh darn it, it's doing it again. Oh my gosh, Mateus. Now I triply need to see this picture because one, I was excited just to see your rabbit. Two, now I want to see you as a kid. Oh my gosh. Um, and three, I want to see the giant rabbit now. Like, I, I just, I need to see a picture. That's it. I love it. Yeah, we need the expansion pack here. Um, and so. I think that it should be to heal. And I've just lost it again. I think it should be to heal. To follow closely. Yes, because you are shaking following closely the introduction of some thing. And so it's like you shake following mud. You shake following water. And um, it's going to be the same as the positive. And that will help to reinforce it. Okay, I need to do a personal call to Matesa's parents, find out if they have pictures of the, the rabbit. <laughs> or Matesa can call and ask. No, that's fine. I mean, um, I, I do allow you two personal calls per month, and you've only done one, so if you want to use your second one up on this, that's fine. Anyway, a little ridiculousness over here. <laughs> Make this happen down below so we can celebrate and then we can start talking about forms for these okay. things. Okay. I think it works. All right, let's celebrate. All right. We're, so. we're having our celebratory granola um, in place of Copico, which if you weren't here earlier, then you may not know. We forgot. Yep. Um, this bit looks yeah, particularly good. flavorful. All right. Mm. Cheers, work partner. 
Oh wait, we should have asked if there's nuts in this. That would be a surprise. Mmm, mmm, mmm. It's delicious. Mm-hmm. It really is. Mmm. 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 Mm. If you do, Mateus, gotta share those. You want another one? I do. Do you want another? Sure, I do. Well, let's break this one into a bit smaller piece, so then there are roughly the same amounts. There we go. Okay. Now you can pick whether you want a bigger one or two smaller ones. I want the big one, and you can take all the rest. Mm-hmm. What is kaju kotli, Jake? Mm. There are little bits of granola is what we have. Mm. Served on a beautiful little platter. Good stuff. I can taste the cinnamon. It's really delicious because it's not sweet. It's just very, like, flavorful without I, being sugary. I like it. I mean, it's granola. It usually doesn't have sugar. Granola chunks quite often. You may be surprised when you dig in and it's, like, very sugary to hold it together. Well, real granola, not like granola bars, you know, kids' things. Kind of like cashew marzipan with condensed milk covered in silver leaf. What? Hmm. Oh, my goodness. And ragdoll is going on our cinnamon theme here. Wow. Okay. No, that sounds nice. Cinnamon in the Earl Grey tea. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now that we have celebrated with some granola, let's get some forms. Mm-hmm. And so, David, do you want to put the... Yeah, we're just going to say everybody's going to remember. You're going to remember. Um, I mean, you do have Lexergy if you want to throw things in. And and Lexergy also in the little notes, it tells you. Tells you all the sounds. Yeah. Um, we need four new verbs. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to double check. I think they should be... Um, you know, one of them can probably be pretty short like CV um, and in fact these types of things it could be like the proto form ends in a fa or something and then it disappears you know we can make a few of them even shorter um, especially the positive ones um, I'm gonna go ahead and start typing here J Oh my gosh. Kind of like that bubble. Yeah, but it turns out I don't know the things to type. So I am. Oh, I got it. So yeah, bull is going to be bull is going to become ball. Ball. Kind of like that. Um and oh seeing as we don't have a p for purple hold on no that's right no that that's definitely going to be a negative one so jesse it's up to you this is for purple to give us purple negation are we going to have that be negative equative or negative locative shake or flee for ultimately what's going to become ball and wow both of them. Oh, it's got to be pharyngealized with an R or not pharyngealized with an L, huh? Yeah. Uh, so I just did B schwa L as the proto form. Okay. And what it, you're asking, which? Yeah, shake or flee. What does it feel like to you? Just one second while I think about that. Mm -hmm. Say it again for me with that beautiful L. Ball. (laughs) 
Um, <laughs> I mean, he sounds a little bit like Bale. I was thinking flee for whatever reason, but I couldn't put my finger on it, so maybe that's it. <laughs> um, so in that case... Cinderella is let the ball. So we've got that. Silver tail is suggesting... Oak. Oak. And... Uh, Tethys has ma. I'm gonna leave this here. We're gonna do examples later. So and then I'm and gonna And yeah, Miles, that. we're trying to come up with forms. It's I mean it's brainstorming plus we're actually picking them, you know. These are two Pulp suggested and uh, ma. Let's throw them in. Well, Mateus, that works. Sixteen. That's that's still younger. And we also had, I thought, some forms. Talk. Talk. That probably should come out as talk. Um, I mean, it could be a negative equity, but it could be a positive. Talk. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of the, uh, the um, copula of Irish, which is ta, or one of the copulas of Irish, which is ta, ta, and then because it's velarized, right? Ta. And. Um, comes from the same source that gives Spanish esta. Um, I'm gonna throw this one here. Of course, that copied differently. Oh yeah, oh yeah, let's. I thought that may be good for to shake. I think that's that's actually really lovely. Q, mm -hmm. it comes to. Um, yeah, forget it, we're just gonna write that in. Okay, so the, the modern is going to be Shake, um, chew, right? That's that's just how we're doing it, yeah? I think so. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um, wait, no, no, chew. Because we're, yeah. And then, this is, okay. Oops. You shake. Chew. Chew. All right, that's good. All right, Miles has suggested this form that feels a little heavy, though, for our two remaining. If we did it, I think stand would be potentially better, maybe. This is for positive? Mm, I think that would be much more likely for a negative. Um, unless the D just drops out and we end up with hue, which could be interesting. So like, you know, huid becomes huid, becomes hue, becomes hue. And then, and then the full verb form could still maintain the full form. Yeah. That'd be kind of cool to have two different words. Yeah. Um, and I, I think like that. that I think that you're right. That does feel like stand, which is something that is really likely to get drastically reduced, since it's not going to have the status that standing does in English. It's going to be much more basic. In fact, it might not even have uh, a real world reflex anymore yeah since like it's kind of strange because essentially dogs do have a basic position but it's like humans don't really i think though the the full verb could mean like it has to now if you use the full form it means to stand up like you were in another position okay and then you stood up okay yeah so it's um an activity now so let's Quit. And yeah, the voiceless stops are all aspirated or aspirated and something else um, like with uh, labialization. So like the K in the protoforms can either be just an aspirated K or it could be um, a K labialized aspirated. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I really like that. And then this will end up meaning to stand up. It's also interesting because I don't think that there's any other way that you can get just an eh in that position. Oh, I forgot to keep this. 
Um, and let me double check on that. Yeah, but um, no, never mind. You can get it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was just me being silly. All right, so now we need our positive copula. Should be nice and short. I mean, ma is a great possibility. And that just stays ma, right? Yep. Um, ma. Uh, I think uh, ta is a great possibility too. So in other words, we're gonna we would drop that Q and it would just be ta um, as a copula. But then we'd have ta and Q. Mm. Which could mm, I don't know. Could be interesting. I'm not willing to rule that out. I'm not saying it should be that, but it could be kind of interesting because it might suggest that there's some sort of similarity between the two, even though there isn't, which could be fun. Just because they're both stops? Uh, yeah, oh, you know, but it's always going to be pharyngealized, isn't it? So no, they wouldn't. Yeah, yeah never mind. I was going to say it's going to be pharyngealized and... The spelling would, would match, but it would actually be, you know, this is a palatal, not... Oh, sure. And I, I think that, well, the thing is, you could see it if, the, if they were both pharyngealized or both not. Yeah. But, but no, without that, never mind. Oh, um, we got, um, here, hold on a sec. Why don't you take this? Yeah, it's easier for you to get out. Ooh, there's, there seems to be a mail delivery or something. Uh, I think so, I think. Hi there. So, I'm John's friend, David. Um, I think that we met before, but it might have been seven or eight or ten years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah were, I have the email to them. All right. Did you want to say hi to them? Uh, sure. Here. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll rustle them out. But just if you don't want to be on camera, we're doing a live stream. Stay there. If you don't mind. You the camera is totally way. pointing at me, so you are so far out of frame that there you are me. not. And hello, by the way. Um, probably, yeah. Hmm? As we're thinking through that, though, I, I like the, the, the talk thing. Okay. And so, right. I can't say it, but, you know, I'll right. get, I'll get practice. Uh, you, yeah. Oh, you have a visitor, and you also have a mail. I just wanted to, like, oh, drop I, off your mail. Oh, uh, okay. So tell Lodi I said happy birthday. Hi, uh, let me have this, uh, these are my friends Dave and Jesse. They're from visiting from Southern California. And you know what? Carol and I went to Filoli today, and we were thinking you should have been with us because the flowers were just amazing. And you should sit down again so my arm oh, can get a rest. shares yeah. your love for flowers. She, she should have yes. been photographing your whole yard. Of our it's gorgeous out there. Were you responsible for the orange flowers out front? Um, Who was the one? Who was it? I know she's planted some flowers out there, but I don't know if can. Well, somebody told me that, like, because the rest of them are whatever, but but one of, I thought it was one of the daughters did the orange flowers. Oh, nice, sit, Jake. Like, Good job. Maybe I just made that up. Yeah. Oh. And I say good job because I know you did great on your Korean speaking test. Oh, John. So I just went ahead and said good. Uh, no, no, we're still going. We, we oh. got, like, 27 minutes. But since you were out here... Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to tell you, so somebody mentioned Prince, and that reminded me of something that I wanted to tell you the other day. So you know Prince wrote the song, Nothing Compares to You, that Sinead O'Connor um, uh, covered. If you say so, I've never been a Prince fan, so. Well, it, it's rare, but everybody's heard of sh the Sinead O'Connor version of Nothing Compares to You, right? It was a uh, huge... Well, apparently everyone, since I'm not familiar with it. It was a huge hit in like 1989. Nothing well, compares... By 89, I was listening to solely, I uh, switched to over to world music, so oh. I was no longer listening to Western pop or anything. So. She's from Ireland, though. That's well, world, I mean, music. world music. I mean, uh, you know, All Africa right. and Caribbean and stuff. Listen, whatever. I'm mm -hmm. going to tell you this. So this song, which, so uh, Prince gets the credit because she just did a cover of it. But the song, Nothing Compares to You, you know, it has its chords, it has its chord progressions and everything. There is one instance of the chord B in the entire song, mm -hmm. and it just fits perfectly. Um, that's fantastic. That's great to know. 
that that was it. But it's like it, it's it's so incredible because it's like the rest of the song. It's just like it has its chord progressions. All the chords repeat. They do whatever. And there's just one B, and it's like it comes right in the middle. And it's like I know a piece of classical music. Yeah. That's uh, about twelve minutes long. Um, that has no chords of any kind. It's a completely atonal piece of music. It's a modern, you know, avant-garde piece of music. Mm -hmm. Except the final note is a grand C chord. Just uh, it's called um, Polymorphia by the Polish composer uh. Krzysztof Penderecki, whose music can be heard all over the Stanley Kubrick movie The Shining. Um, ah. And uh, he's got an early work called Polymorphia that's uh, quite amazing uh, in terms of it. It's like a sonic line, land, uh, soundscape, you know, and it's completely atonal. There's no chords or notes of any kind. And, and uh, suddenly after all this barrage of amorphous sound, after 12 minutes, it suddenly just... With a big C chord. Well, he really missed an opportunity. The song could have been called See You at the End, where S E E was spelled with a C. <laughs> <laughs> All right. By but, the way, I've, I've, I've just been receiving an email asking several questions regarding linguistics that I wanted to confer with you about. Um, I didn't know if it was something that. Ooh. of interest to your listeners at all. Well, here, let's just take one minute. Let's finish this. So we're going to go ahead with talk. With talk. Yes, and I, I wrote it here, and I added it to the list at top. You can... All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it in. Uh, okay, but yeah, so where did this email come from? Um, some friends of ours have a niece who's in Canada, uh -huh. and she's doing a research project right now. Uh, regarding human evolution, and she's uh, studying a section about when humans first evolved language, and she has three questions about the evolution of language um, as it relates to a reflection of how language has evolved, specifically the Piraã people oh, yeah. from Brazil and their strange language. Mm -hmm. And she has three questions about how such a language could have evolved. Uh, so I want to know my opinion, mm -hmm. and I wanted to confer with you uh, before I send her some tentative answers to her questions. Oh boy, all right, so here we go, language evolution, can't wait for this. Okay, question one, she writes, I came across the Piraan people, and in their language they have no future or past tense. Are they still able to learn from things that happened in the past? Oh no. Like for example, la quote, last time it rained a lot, this area of the field flooded. So if it rains a lot again, we can expect another flood, quote, unquote, or similar. In other words, can they think slash make such statements? Goodness gracious. I mean, well, well, obviously these questions are, are coming from someone who, you know, is not trained in linguistics. But, our, uh, our comment section is filling up with, oh no, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Question number two. Uh, uh, do we know what causes a language to evolve and lack something like a future or past tense? Or, I know other languages don't have terms for certain colors. To me, it seems like, from an evolutionary perspective, that would be a huge disadvantage. So that's not really, oh, a, that's okay. not really a question, uh, but uh, I mean, it's, it's an implied question. Uh, so. And last question, number three. I was trying to find when humans first evolved language, and I feel like I came across a huge variety of timelines. Oh, yeah. Is there a popular approximation of when humans evolved language? Yep. So she's asking me those three questions. And I figure, why have why answer with one linguist in the house when, I, when there, we have three linguists in the house? So I figure we could come to consent, some yeah. consensus answers for me to write back with her. Yeah. And now we have a bunch of people online who can uh -huh. help us 
give uh, input into the answers that are going to be sent in here? Well, uh, I've got uh, some thoughts already, but for the last one, I think that's the easiest, which is that, of course, you know, all we know about language is what we have recorded in writing, and that only goes back so far. And we know that language was much older than our earliest recorded writing. We so it's like 100,000. That Homo sapiens sapiens has been using language since they were Homo sapiens sapiens, since they had the physical ability to, you know, do it. Yeah, pretty now, much. Nathan, you know, Neanderthalensis uh, had the ability, I, I don't know. Um, I, I wouldn't and put it past them. George is saying um, is George that one Corley. keeps moving back. I've heard 100,000 years, then 300,000 years, and some people estimate much farther. Yeah. Um, so basically she's answered her own question because she says she's read varying timelines. And yeah, that seems to still be the case. I mean, I think that the most important thing, the po most important takeaway is that it is well before we have any type of recorded history for what language was like. Well before. So like any, any speculation about what language might have been like then is just like the guess of a guess of a guess of somebody wearing a blindfold and earplugs. Which I always, you know, whenever we try to go back that way, I always kind of smirk because if Latin were an unwritten language, you literally could not reconstruct the Latin numbers for, from, uh, for 1 through 10 using standard glottochronology, uh, you know, historical linguistic principles from the numbers 1 through 10 in the daughter languages, you wouldn't get you wouldn't get it right. You know, you'd have, I mean, how you how you reconstruct quatuor, you know, from the daughter languages of Latin's uh, words for four, you know, you're not going to get there. Yeah. So, so if we can't even do that in a two thousand year frame, a time frame. How how are we going to make any predictions about language? I mean, 10, 20, 30, 100, 40, 000, like, years ago. It's just, so for the second question, I had two things. So the one is that, and the biggest, I think, most important takeaway is that just because we don't have either a word or a grammatical structure for it doesn't mean that we don't understand the concept and can't make use of it. Okay, now I'm going to play devil's advocate with uh -huh. you on that answer. Just, not, not that I don't agree with you, but just to play devil's advocate. Uh -huh. Um, let's get Warfian for a second here, and I myself am a uh, believer in the weak, shall we say, weakest version of the spear warf hypothesis, and mm -hmm. the idea that the grammar of a language influences influences our ability to consider certain thoughts more saliently versus less sal saliently. You know, depending on whether the grammar encodes a specific, you know, set of morphemes or morphology for it. So, if a language such as Pirao that does that lacks all tenses, you know, has no way of encoding in any kind of uh, succinct way for these concepts, does it make thinking about them uh, more difficult or more fuzzy? You know? I I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no. But like, so I'll, I'll give you a nice example in English. Like we can say, you know, you know, um, I go to the airport on Saturday, for example, because we are, we are going to the airport on Saturday. That's, there's nothing future in that at all. We just know that that's going to happen. And that, you know, because of on Saturday means Saturday. So you can do that in English. You can also do other things. In Finnish, you must do that. There is no generic thing that says future. You always just use the non-past tense with some sort of, whether it's tomorrow or the next day or like on Saturday or something, and it's just understood from context. And they seem to get on just fine. They created angry birds. I think they're, <laughs> I think so they're, they're angry is what you're saying. I, I think that they're just absolutely fine with that. So the other one, now this one I actually saw of all things, this would have been in like the, early 2000s in a documentary on PBS at like 3.30 in the morning when I was at my parents' house and I happened to be up. 
and they were uh, it was and I don't know why it was a TV documentary but they were doing a um, they were doing some research on a, a native Mexican tribe that were one of these groups that had fewer color terms than English does and so they were doing some uh, um, they were doing an experiment with them where they had colored chips and the, and the, they had two different words one that uh, white and pink same term and the other one that red and orange same term and so they did a whole bunch of tests for them like you know uh, here's the pattern can you complete it and they do a pattern of red orange red orange red orange and just easily and flawlessly they completed this pattern as if you know like you know this how well, is this challenging a good analogy is the fact that you know english as i'm sure most of the people on this uh, podcast listening in know that um, we have 11 identified basic color terms yep. in, in english as do most of the western romance languages however russian and probably some of the other slavic languages have 12. yeah you know they make a, 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 a lexical distinction at the basic level, meaning you know, a single word morphine that doesn't, that's not derivable from anything, uh, for what we call light blue versus standard blue, dark blueish, that range, you know. It's kind of uh, like red versus pink for us, but with yeah. the blues. Yeah. But, you know, so for, so for a Russian person, you know, the sky is is seen in the, and something that uh, we would call you know, a darker blue. Is going to be a what's the word? Gullaboy. Gull yeah. Gullaboy. And, yeah. And to them, that's as distinct as red and pink is for us in right. terms of, you know, cognitive saliency based on, on uh, lexical morphology. And so, uh, so, uh, yet yeah, here we have an example where Russian does it and English doesn't. Mm -hmm. Yet. Does, do any of our listeners today think <laughs> yeah. that we have any trouble distinguishing sky blue from a darker, you know, the blue of blue jeans, for example? Yeah. yeah. And, the, and the other thing, so they, they did this on the little, um, you know, uh, the, the little TV documentary. You say, you know, hand me a blank one where it's like red or orange. And it was like 50-50 where they hand them a red or orange. But you can imagine an English speaker, too. You have a, a whole blue bowl of like dark blue chips and light blue chips, and you say, "Hand me a blue one." Like, I don't know. you just grab one. It doesn't matter, but it doesn't mean they can't tell the difference between the two things. Uh, so, so yeah, um, that is. Uh, those are some darling, bless her heart questions that uh, you have I received. Know, I still have one, question well, number one. Answer. Just one second. Hunda Kufin actually wrote their BA thesis about um, color terms, and it's titled The So Called 11 Basic Color Terms Are Very Much Contestable. Um, and then Magpie was saying the un that it's really the interesting part happens when you don't tell them how many groups to sort color chips into, because it's like if you just say, Group these, uh, sure. Then you know people are are going to do it um, in a way that probably makes sense with how their language has words for color terms. And this article Logan suggested for us, I've downloaded it. So it looks super interesting. Number is a cognitive technology evidence from the Parahan language and cognition, and it has Evelina Fedorenko, who we had recently met. Yeah, because uh, Dan Everett's over at. Uh, um He's at MIT, right? No, he's at the, Illinois State. All the other three authors are at MIT. Well, I talked to a guy who was friends with Dan Everett who was either at Harvard or MIT because the first time I went to, I, gave, I did a talk at Boston College. That was where I met Evelina and it was, and, and so I went to Harvard and I went to MIT. So he was at one of those two places. He was friends with Dan Everett and so I talked to him. So I'm not surprised that they all know each other. And Jackson Crawford. Oh my. Who I don't think this is the right person. It's but translator. It, it may be. Um, but anyway, um, Logan is saying Jackson Crawford has some very interesting articles about historical color terms. Yeah. Um, now, yeah. you know, something just was said by uh, one of your viewers about, you know, it becomes more interesting when people aren't given um, mm -hmm. defining terms and, and have to sort their own color groups based on their uh, native language, usually. It made me think 
um, a language like Welsh, if I co re if recall correctly, mm. the Welsh color terms don't map one to one with English. Uh, they one of their color terms goes into the brown area that where or that English doesn't. Uh, uh, I yeah, 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 yeah. That from an article in the literature. Um, now, what what is of interest to me is that. I doubt there are very many monolingual Welsh speakers in the world, right? So let's just say 99% of Welsh speakers on earth are very likely at least bilingual uh, in Welsh and English, right? So they are in theory operating with conflicting color, ter color term sets that don't map one to one. So if we do that experiment, with one of these bilingual Welsh people um, who, uh, you know, and, and give them a color set, and we give them the instructions in Welsh to set the, so, you know, they separate these terms by color, and then later at a time when they've forgotten what, how they did on the first test, maybe two weeks later or something, we give them the test again, this time in English instructions. Mm -hmm. Do they group them the same way, or does, do the brown chips get messed up and, and yeah. set, put into different groups than, than when they did it with Welsh instruction. So here, here's my thought on that. Let's say that they do show up a, a result. To me, it's still not very interesting, and I will tell you why. Because it doesn't, I don't think it changes the way that they see the colors, like it, which is, you know, the big superior war. Ooh, and I don't think it actually says anything about how they perceive or... Or, or do that because it's still a language task. Uh, essentially what you're saying is how do you sort these colors via your language? Mm -hmm. And so that, I don't know, it's just not interesting to me. It doesn't say anything about the brain. It doesn't say anything about humans. It says something about humans' relationship to their own language, uh, which it's like, well, duh. We already knew that. We had the words for it. We could see what the, <laughs> what the terms were. Why is this interesting? Why do you think this shows us anything? Uh, let's say we see some differences in those two tests of the Welsh person. Sure. In the, where the brown chips end up. Let's now ask that Welsh person in Welsh, why is this chip in this group? You know, and point to one of the ones that was in a group that's different than the, than the English language result. Or vice versa. You know, like, let's take half the half the Welsh speakers who, whose brown chips wound up in different sets on the two tests. Let's take half of them and ask them in Welsh, why did this chip wind up here and not in with the other chips here? And then the other half of the group, let's ask them the same thing in English and ask, see what their answers are. Why is this chip here in in this set, you know, <laughs> uh, and see what uh, what kind of you know results or what their answers are. Um, yeah. Total side note: Jackson Crawford. Uh huh. Wait, why was this on Boulder? Oh, University of Wisconsin. Right, but like Jackson Crawford showed up on the Boulder website, and so I was like, I think. Let's see. Um, no, none of those. No. Um, but the dissertation is definitely um, from University of Wisconsin Madison, huh. and I was like, "Wait, did we go to the same school, just slightly different times?" Huh. Well, as you think about that, so we're approaching the end of our time, and so what we usually do is um, you're looking at the glasses on our thing. I'm wondering why the top of your apple disappears when you die. You ever notice that? What? No. What? Here, okay, I'm gonna, Here, I'm gonna... Am I still? No, it's not happening. Why did that happen? Oh, it did it again. I I don't know. Are you, are you, are you, what are you doing right now? I'm just the apple, I'm moving. I'm just moving around. I don't know. Okay, apparently when you use your I think it on your mouse no, pad, I it may be slightly moving this because it's just a reflection. And so, like, if I'm slightly uh, moving my uh, computer, talk about. I just I just I'm got totally John Q a little my visual, uh, my visual inputs right oh, oh, I've had that happen before. Jackson Crawford taught at Boulder and Berkeley. Twenty fourteen to twenty seventeen. Oh my, that's uh 
and then UCLA, that's the post, oh, 2017 to 2020. Did, I think he made, no, I, I was there. I was there, uh, Boulder. Wow. Anyway, so uh, at the end of our live stream every week, we, um, we come up with a question to ask uh, the people on our, on our Patreon to a uh, poll question to vote on. And then based on the results of that poll, we, uh, we change the language accordingly. And I just had an idea uh, about uh, our, our next poll. And I want to throw this out to you and see if you think it's a good idea. But I hope you do, because once I say it, I think everybody's going to be so excited, they're just going to want to do it. We've just been looking at me the whole time. Sorry, I'll fix that. Um, anyway, so are you ready for this or are you typing? I'm ready. I was just trying to keep up with comments so that way commenters knew the whole time. Yeah. And, and you'll see that this got added. Yeah, that's really, I'm really excited by that. I like it. Okay. Okay, but here's, here's my idea. So to, to, to catch John up, this is the language for anthropomorphic dogs. And, in, uh, and our idea here was that the dogs originally, when they gained sentience, they separated into dog communities of like, you know, Dotsons versus Labradors and so on. Okay, and whatever you did more recently, I think when you turned it, you made the audio echoey. It just recently happened, and I think it happened when you turned it. I don't know, though. Go on. Sounds normal again, she says. Okay. All right, well, whatever. Anyway, so, um, so uh, when... Uh, eventually then they kind of like had an understanding and then came together and made a confederation of dogs uh, so that they're essentially the different dog clans and they come together and they have representatives and they all decide things you know doggily right but um, and they and they speak the same language but they'll naturally have different vocabularies and different traditions and so I had an idea for a number poll because you know every time you know we decide on a number base I thought we throw up a bunch of different number bases and we take the top three winners and we make the number system feature all of them. So let's say that like base uh, eight, base 10, and base 20 win. Ultimately, it's gonna be base 20. Whatever the highest one is, that's the base, but then Base, uh, so the numbers like one through seven are gonna come from one language. The numbers for eight through 10 are gonna come from a different set of dogs, right? And then the numbers 11 through 19 are gonna come from another set of dogs. You see? And so. But then they'll, how will you know? We're just going to have to make it, you know, we'll, we'll essentially, we'll create different patterns for each one. You know, a thought occurs to me, just listening yeah. to this coming from the outside, is okay. uh, why don't you incorporate the different number bases uh, the same way a language like English does it? So we are, you know, nominally we are base 10, right? Yeah. Uh, except for when we're counting things like uh, supplies and like eggs and stuff. Suddenly we go base 12 and count things in dozens. Right. And gross. So suddenly for certain so. contexts we go base 12. And then I'm sure there's other bases that we, like base 60 for timekeeping. Oh know? yeah, apparently so that came from what John, What John is saying is what Miles had interpreted the poll's goal would be to have three different counting systems, but like you use them differently depending on what's being counted. Um, and so things that could be important so to them. So in dog cases, let's look at the world from the viewpoint of dogs, maybe the number system for counting the puppies in a litter uses a certain base three, for example. Uh, and that's the only time base three is used when counting the puppies in a litter. Because it would be like one, two, litter, so and then litter plus one, litter what, plus two. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So base three makes sense for for you know, keeping things small and, and, and you know, you, uh, not too confused. Uh, and then what's uh, what's some, what's another example? You know, if you use how, how many toes do they have? I mean, they obviously have five. How many but, do they have? But one of them yeah. is hidden. A right? dewclaw. Yeah. yeah. Which is well, which gives rise to your base eight. Yeah. Maybe. 
Uh, but would it be base 8, or since they're four-legged, would it be 16? Since yeah, they're, they're four-legged. Yeah, well, essentially, since they become upright. Oh, they're upright now. Okay, but um, but by the way, the easy way to tell, like if you're saying, like, well, how could you tell? You know how, like, in English, right, we have special words for 11 and 12, and then it's like 13, 14, 15, 16. Um, you lose that specialness once you get to 20. And so, like, there's no, like, uh, there's no version of 11 or 12 once you get past 20. And so that's how so you... So from 20 plus, if the system you described one, 20 plus would just follow the bigger system. That's right. And so it would no longer use, like 21 would actually not be related to their number one because their number one came from a different base. Yeah, or like I suppose this could be a separate thing. Let's say that base 10 one, there could be a special word for 20 that didn't look like it was built off of the thing that's going to ultimately give us 30. Okay. So like, whereas like, you know, 30 could be like 310, but 20 is going to be like totally its own route. And then 30 would be 310. Maybe 40 would be like 220, right? Okay, so we can, so yeah, on. we can discuss that. People are, are liking the number pole idea. Okay. Some people are like, it sounds awful. I love it. Um, <laughs> and Another so. Is, uh, dogs like to run. Why uh, uh, up, up, uh, aspect of their culture that could use a different number base, say base six, uh, hexadecimal, would be running, uh, distances. Distances, you know, like their equivalent of miles and... Uh, That's true. Yeah. Uh, We've never developed you know, distance like, terminology. Could be a base, a base uh, 16 uh, or base 8, you know, use your base 8 or your hexadecimal for the multiplications of distances. Oh boy, they could have some really complex measured words. Right. Based on totally different bases. All right. Okay, yeah. So perfect. Okay. We'll, we'll do something about number for yep. the poll. All right. Um, yeah. So we will. We will figure that out, and yeah, we'll see you next Thursday from our normal location. All right. Um, and patrons. As opposed to this location, which is an extremely abnormal. Extremely abnormal. Very. Um, and patrons. People in it. And patrons, um, we will release a podcast soon. Okay, and then you can say goodbye to John. Nice yeah. meeting you all. Happy Happy birthday. Birthday. Bye. Bye. Nice meeting you guys. All right. Oh, and by Bibleridian, you are too late, but nice of you to show up in the last second. Yep. We, we still heart you. And um, until next time, stay all grammar. Right. Bye, everybody. Bye. All right. There we go. And then.